Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I feel really privileged to present you uh, the first session of today's uh, seminar. Population growth and climate change are among, among the major drivers that necessitate global transformation, as we have already heard. But inevitable transformation calls for investments. And the Global Commission on the Economy and the Finance, the international initiative that actually developed this new economic concept, has already identified three key investment areas, infrastructure, urban development, and land use change. And just based on this, it comes natural that transformation probably should start from the cities. Why? As you probably know, today 55% of world's population resides in urban areas. So global urban population in 1951, 750 million. Global urban population in 2018, 4.2 two billions, almost six times up in just 70 years. And this percentage is expected to increase to 68% by 2050, as another 2.5 billion people will be added in urban areas, as reported in 2018 uh, revision of world's urbanization prospects, which was launched by the Population Division of the UN Department of Economic and Social Affairs. And may I remind you that when we are talking about modern cities, Tokyo, currently the largest city in the world, has already reached 37 million of people, almost four times the population of Greece or Sweden, respectively. However, what we probably do not fully realize is that cities occupy only 2% of total land. Still, they concentrate 70% of the gross domestic product. They are responsible for over 60% of the global energy consumption. They emit more than 70% of greenhouse gases per year. And they produce around 70% again of global waste. So talking about transformation, it's a great challenge of its own and it should take all these aspects into account. And then again, imagine what the challenges become when at the same time nations need to accelerate economic development in order to be able to feed all these people and to tackle with the risks posed by climate change. And the risks by climate change can be huge in cities if you take into account the population density and the presence of critical infrastructure in the cities. And actually, we do not need to bring images from the third world in our minds when thinking about climate-driven uh, disasters. In this very own city that is hosting uh, today's seminar, Athens, we have had several hundreds of casualties during the last few years, either from floods or peri-urban wildfires that struck with unprecedented severity. And one would wonder, what could be an overarching objective for modern societies to be pursuing all around the world in order to implement this looking imperative transformation that we are talking about? I would say resilience, the capacity to withstand or absorb all these type of stressors, recover from their disastrous impacts, and prepare for future perturbations. And Europe needs not only to transform itself, it needs and is able to drive this global transformation, seizing this unique opportunity we are having now. And then transition should be underpinned not only by the flow of capital, but also innovation, entrepreneurship, and most importantly, the preservation of natural resources. And all new and smart technologies are mostly available. And then what is currently needed is just to understand the key trends in global finance, urbanization and climate, and rapidly redirect economies and strategies towards climate smart investments. Renewable power, energy efficiency, green buildings, the private sector adaptation to climate change are just a few of them, as many others already uh, mentioned by Johan previously. 
and be sure that climate smart investments already save lives and properties in different parts of the world. So we have definitely entered the era when we must turn all these challenges and risks to opportunities. It's steadily maturing, as we can see, and it's now the time for real action. So I thank you very much for your attention, and I feel very pleasure now to introduce you to our distinguished panelists in this first session. The first one is Gunnar Schöderholm. He is the former director for the Environment and Health Administration in the city of Stockholm. Between 2002 and 2006, he has served as a deputy general director for the city of so Stockholm, among other things, being responsible for the introduction of the congestion sack system and the information and communication technology development in the city. Uh, he is probably among the most suited persons to explain how urban planning investments can really work side by side with climate change and how long-term vision and planning can turn what seems probably impossible now to world-class best practices. Gunnar, the floor is yours. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellencies, and ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you for inviting me uh, to this very important conference. As a Swede, you feel quite humble to speak in an academia founded by Platon almost 2,000 years before it was a Sweden. And uh, the only uh, MBMB, your uh, heritage from uh, uh, millenniums. Uh, in Sweden 200 years ago, a famous poet, Isaiah Stegner, wrote that the only Swedish heritage we have is barbarians. Um, we catch up the last uh, centuries, but, um, uh, but we feel the difference when you are in a place like this. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, the, uh, the urban planning in, in the city has been going on for uh, almost 100 years, and Stockholm was named as the first green capital of Europe. It meant a lot to us, and we had a number of successors uh, after us, Hamburg and, um, um, uh, um, um, uh, sorry, um, Nantes, uh, Vittoria Gestes, and, uh, and also uh, Oslo and uh, Copenhagen, and with, among others. Uh, Oslo is the green capital this year, and Lisbon will be the next year. Um, Stockholm is one of the fastest growing uh, cities in, in Europe. Um, we uh, thought that we would be the first Nordic million city in 2030. Now we know that we will pass a million somewhere around uh, 2020, 2021. And, uh, and we have a program for uh, new apartments. It's an increase by multifamily uh, buildings by 35% in Stockholm. And this will change the pattern of Stockholm. And we have to do it in a sustainable way. The master plan for Stockholm is to create a more dense city. Uh, we also have the public behind us. Stockholmers were quite proud when we were awarded as the first green capital. Uh, even if some said, if Stockholm is best in Europe, how does the rest of the continent look like? But uh, the, I think Stockholmers care about environment and they want the city of Stockholm to have a high profile in environment. To be the first green capital actually changed the mindset in the city hall. Today, we face a totally political consensus about the environmental issues in Stockholm. And that is a huge difference compared to how it was 15 years ago in the city of Stockholm. So it meant a lot. And we have a vision for Stockholm in 2040. Uh, and we add a number of programs, the environmental program, the climate strategy, the, uh, the master plan for Stockholm, and uh, also the traffic plan for Stockholm into the same vision. And the basic and the most important goal and objective we have in Stockholm is to be a fossil fuel city in 2040. 
that is a big challenge. We are down now to 2.3 tons. We measure electricity, heating, and traffic. We will have a fossil-free heating in a few years, 20, latest 2022, uh, but we, uh, the big challenge is the traffic solutions. And, and, and I will come back a little bit to, to that. When it comes to the climate change, uh, we have a number of programs. Uh, uh, we, of course, are aware about that. We, uh, Swedes, consume much more carbon dioxide than we measure consumption, but we don't find any reliable data to measure it and to compare it. So our late figures is from uh, 1990. We have cut down, as I show in the last slide, the, uh, the emissions of uh, greenhouse gases in Stockholm by 40% and by uh, per citizen much more than that. So a uh, growing city is sharing less carbon dioxide from that aspect. But what we have to remember is that Stockholm 100 years ago was one of the most poor, unhealthy and dirty cities in Europe. We were in the really outskirts of Europe. And the first program was to create healthy apartments and healthy housing. And this is our heritage from 100 years ago. And Stockholm was very early to adopt the uh, new ideas from Germany and from Austria in the 1920s, the Bauhaus Schule, the modernism and the Stockholm exhibition in the 1930s was a breakthrough to have a totally other mindset of new housing. And with that heritage, a number of uh, um, uh, parts. The first eco district in Stockholm was Hammarby Waterfront. And it has been perhaps the most visited uh, eco district in the, in the world, uh, uh, from the president of China to kings and uh, prime ministers to school classes. It's quite well known not least in China, where they tried to copy Hammarby Waterfront. And the aim was to cut down the environmental impact by 50%. And when we started in the early 1990s, the construction companies and the developers screamed that this is impossible. It's too hard demands. But they made it almost when it comes to, and the progress in Hammarby Waterfront now um, uh, continues, not least by the groups around uh, 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 in Hammarby Waterfront called Electric City and shared by the former Minister of Finance, Alan Larsson. They do make a fantastic job in, in Stockholm. And some of the examples here in Stockholm too uh, is um, uh, I will show you some of the cooperation between the private companies and, uh, and um, the city of Stockholm. But what was unique by Hammarby Waterfront, and actually the first time in the city where different agencies came together in a united uh, office to plan uh, the whole area. And this holistic approach to city planning was a breakthrough also for the sustainability. Then you all know that we were running for the Olympics in 2004. Uh, we were running for uh, the Green Olympics. You were running for the 100 years anniversary from the first Olympic Games and we lost it to you. Uh, at that time when we lost it, we were a bit sad, but when I was in the city hall and uh, we were not the Olympic village in the Hammarby waterfront for, because the idea was that uh, the tenants should move out, the residents should move out from their apartments and let the athletes and the leaders and journalists and media in. It had been a chaos in Stockholm, so when I was in the city hall, I said thanks that Athens took the Olympic Games. But, uh, uh, um, 
but one of the best examples of how you can make a showcase of a residential uh, district in, uh, in, uh, in your city is NVAC, who had uh, the vacuum waste collection uh, system. That is, Hammarby Waterfront is the showcase, really, and they have made investments in different parts of the world, uh, not least in, in Asia. The second thing is the Noroya Seaport, where uh, it's the second eco district. Here, uh, we wanted to cut down the environmental impact by another 50% compared to Hammarby Waterfront. And 10 years ago, I very well remember a very brutal meeting in 2008 where the developers and the constructors were screaming, once again, this is impossible, it's too hard demands, you can't, uh, uh, we can't do this. But they actually have made it. And what 10 years ago was impossible, what's made in the Royal Seaport is now mainstreamed into all planning in the city of Stockholm. We also have a fruitful cooperation supported by the European Commission, uh, uh, together with Barcelona and uh, Cologne, the Grow Smarter. It's a low energy district uh, in the south of the inner city in, in, in Stockholm and just outside the inner city of Stockholm, and new solutions and also sustainable mobility solutions. And all these companies have actually uh, uh, made uh, business from the example of this pilot project that Growth Smarter is in, in Stockholm. And also the traffic lighting that is uh, changed to more um, lower um, electricity uh, consumption have made uh, business not only in Stockholm but around uh, Europe actually. And so to the congestion charges. This is another example what uh, you can do. Stockholmers were furious uh, 15 years ago when it was presented in 2002 that we would introduce congestion charges the coming four years as a trial. And 80% were against the idea. And the media called us the most ugly things, the, uh, most, uh, the most expensive suicide ever happened in Stockholm. Or um, they called me and my colleagues the jerks of the year and, uh, and so on. But from uh, um, Stockholm is a city on islands. We are basically on 14 islands, and we control all the traffic in and out of the inner city, where a third of the residentials in Stockholm live, uh, from uh, a little bit more than 20 control points. And we have cut down uh, the traffic, and this is where you have to learn some Swedish. This is for, uh, means before, after, after, and every fourth car disappeared. The first the left uh, picture is the day before the introduction. It's the 2nd of January, 2006. And people were bringing their car to the inner city as it was the last chance in a lifetime to bring your car. But we charge you quite modest price. It was a maximum fee of six euros a day. The passage was maximum uh, uh, two euros, and we charge you between 6.30 in the morning and 6.30 in the afternoon, free uh, in the evenings uh, nights and free in weekends and uh, public holidays. And what happened? Well, as you can see, the blue staples is without the tax, then the red staples is with the tax. No one believes this in Stockholm, but I continue to uh, inform you that we compared to the situation that we are. We were almost between uh, close to 500,000 passages every day during charging time. And now we are down to 300,000. That is a reduction of 40%. And this is despite the fact that we are now 200,000 more people in the city and we have, have a continuous traffic in, in, in Stockholm. IBM was a general entrepreneur, and they made it in a very short time 
And that was a, uh, went from being, a, well, let's see if we can help the city of Stockholm to top 10 in the global IBM business and, uh, and showed what we can do. Stockholm uh, also have a huge investment program for new metro lines, new commuter trains, and new tram lines. And this is partly financed by the revenues from the congestion charges. And the mindset in the city hall has absolutely, it's now a consensus that private car driving is not an example. Um, so we also try to promote uh, um, yeah, environmentally friendly cars or clean cars as we call them. Uh, since uh, 25 years, we had different promoters. First it was ethanol, biogas, now we prepare the city of Stockholm for an, uh, with an electrical vehicle infrastructure. We expect that more than 50% of all cars sold in Stockholm 2025 will be electrical cars. So this is a total mindset. But the bikers have grown uh, and, uh, 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 and not least for good or bad, we have these electrical scooters that is now raining down on the city and uh, the pedestrians are annoyed about it. But it's a mind shift where you leave your car at home and you use public transit bikers and the rental biker program. So we want to be a smart city and Stockholm has a goal to be the smartest city in the world 2040. It's not very humble, uh, but we at least want to be the smartest city in a holistic approach in Stockholm. Thank you very much. So thank you, Gunnar. I don't think we are going to be able to give you back the Olympics, but I certainly hope that you will be generous enough to pass some of this knowledge gained all through these years with concern to sustainability. So, the second panelist I have the pleasure to present is Dr. Dionysia Theodora Vierinopoulou. She serves as the Vice Chair of the Steering Committee of the Global Water Partnership Organization in Stockholm, Sweden, and as the Head of Water of the Energy and Environment Committee of the International Chamber of Commerce in Paris, France. She's also chairing the European Institute of Law, Science and Technology. She has served twice as a member of the Hellenic Parliament, chairing the Environment Committee. And her today's talk will navigate us from smart and climate smart investments to green responsible investments and will unfold a range of frames and opportunities to mobilize, redirect and unlock the transformative power of private resources to deliver tangible, sustainable development outcomes. So, Dionysia, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Your Royal Highness, Your Excellency Ambassador of Sweden in Greece, Minister of the Environment, dear professors, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, it is my great honor to be invited to this very prestigious seminar and address to you the important topic of unlocking investments for the protection of our urban and natural environment. Also, I'm very happy to be here with you to celebrate the 10 years of the Navarino Environmental Observatory and especially thank and congratulate Mr. Achilles Konstantakopoulos for establishing it. I would like to take one minute to personally welcome Her Royal Highness, Crown Prince Victoria of Sweden in Greece, as a fellow young leader of the World Economic Forum. Welcome. And also to express through you, Your Royal Highness, my gratitude to Sweden for two distinctive reasons. The first reason is the support that Sweden provided to me for my candidacy as the executive director of the um, UNEP, the United Nations Environment Program. Sweden and Greece, we both support SDG 14 for the protection of the oceans, and also SDG 6 for the protection of the water sources. And yeah, it is just, uh, I have not started yet. Thank you very much. And for the second reason that I would like to especially thank Sweden is the fact that Sweden is the host country 
to the Global Water Partnership Organization, one of the most important intergovernmental organizations for the environment. Sweden actually is a sponsoring country. It supports us financially and also is the host country. The headquarters of the organization to which I served as a vice chair are in Stockholm, the beautiful city that Gunnar just described to us. The Global Water Partnership Organization uh, is actually a vast network of over 3,000 partner organizations in more than 130, sorry, 83 countries. Out of these, we have 13 regional water partnerships and the Mediterranean region is being hosted here in Greece, in Athens. Our mission is to advance governance and management of water resources for sustainable and equitable development and we are the leader globally for the integrated water resources management. Actually, water is very linked to finance, water sustainability, because water being a public good is very underpriced. We don't have a price on water in many regions in the world. And this is why investors, they don't find it interesting to invest in water resources. As a result, we lack water infrastructure and we have to raise more awareness about the value of water. Let me just give you an example that the World Economic Forum said about water. At least 80% of the water that we use for the agricultural regions is actually totally wasted and we need more investments in order to renew our system for agriculture and water. And this system around the world would be amount about million of dollars. Right now we have a recent bond on behalf of the European Union. That's the first bond for financing of water. The bond, however, is very small and it is a part of the um, sustainability awareness bond that the European Union has created. There is also one other fund that has been created by the World Bank. This fund measures about one billion of dollars for water worldwide. I have advised the Greek government to take advantage of these two bonds and funds for the water. However, the overall um, infrastructure of the financing does not fund water specifically. We have right now a roadmap of investments that, as our previous speakers said, are actually defined by the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sustainable Development Goals and Agenda 2030, they have decided to put forward and draw the attention of the society and the investors to 17 different sets of goals. Some of them, they focus on environment, energy, and climate, and water, but not all of them. And this is why we're trying to drive attention to the water goal that is less um, fund than the rest of the goals. What is very positive is the fact that the United Nations, which is the host organization of the SDGs, of the Sustainable Development Goals, is trying to drive the attention of the global community to specific organizations such as and we have this um, uh, statement. We need urgent action to mobilize, de redirect, and unlock the transformative power of trillion of dollars of private resources to deliver sustainable development and objectives. The public sector, on the other way, need to set a clear direction. So, the UN is trying to draw the attention of both the private sector to create more market tools and public policy instruments on behalf of the governments. These public policy instruments should be directed in two different sets. The first set of finance should be allocated, as we said, to the environmental, social and governance goals and the responsive investments. And the second set should focus on environmental, climate and renewable energy finance. Responsible investments, which is a new category of investments related to environment, social and governance factor, and investments that 
better manage risk and generate sustainable and long-term events. There is a UN principle for responsible investment definition that guides the investments as we understand them today. Because this investment tends to make an impact in society, one other term that we call today is the impact investments. A very important trend today that relates with impact investments is actually what we called as die investment. That is the opposite, not investing in some assets, but die invest, get away from assets that are very heavily environmentally, they're negative environmentally, they create damage to climate, for example, the coal investments. And this is why many pension funds, such as the state of California huge pension fund, or the Norwegian pension fund, which is the first pension fund of the world, uh, having more than one trillion euros in assets under management, they divest, they go away from investments that are climate adverse. And other investors as well, such as Amundi, which is the world leader and actually the largest European fund uh, with more than 1.3 trillion dollars in asset under management, they go away from investments that create damage to climate. So the investment is a very important trade that we have to keep into mind today. Is there a law that imposes investments in environment, soci societal and governance goods? Is there any legislation that imposes the investment? There is no such law yet. What we have in place is only a new directive of the European Union, which is called Directive and, Re and the Regulation on Disclosures Relating to Sustainable Investments and Sustainability Risks. That's the only one, and it is the European Union uh, regulation in two, of 2016, 2341. What we need is more regulation on that. More regulation and more policy development regarding what we call green finance. Green finance is one of the parts of the here of the environmental, social, and governance investments. Green finance, actually, which is the most important uh, thing that we could have in order to develop projects in urban settings, as Gunnar mentioned, is finance that refers to forestry, clean and green technologies, energy efficiency, climate, water sanitation, carbon footprint, industrial pollution, blue economy, waste management, green buildings, disaster management, and so on. And we do have a lot of new financial instruments that we did not know that existed a few years ago in order to promote these green investments. The most important tool that has been developed recently are, is called green bonds. Green bonds and green project and infrastructure bonds are new financial investments that specifically finance infrastructure re relating to either climate, or uh, other green infrastructure. In Greece right now, we don't have developed any green bond, but we should move toward that. In addition, we have other tools like equity, loans, grants, the traditional official development assistance, and also new bank products, such as bank platforms that create and link the assets with the financial and investor partners in order to get more funding. Do we have enough money to support these new financial tools? We do because there has been, over the last five years, a series of decisions on behalf of many institutional partners, such as the European Union, the EBRD, the EIB, the European Investment Bank, and also the G8 economies, that they are going to invest at least 30% of their money that they were offering as either loans or the official development assistance to green and climate projects. Climate economy and climate finance is even 
more in the core of the environmental investments because we might have an, an area of money that is available right now for environmental investments, but the vast majority of this money actually focus on climate investments. And this is because of two reasons. First of all, because climate is more fashionable than the rest of the environmental goals. Everybody speaks about climate and with a good reason. And secondly, because of the new climate economy, which is uh, the topic of this seminar. And very well, Mr. Gerasopoulos, you mentioned that. And also, Johan gave some information about this. Johan, uh, um, announced the goal of the 90 trillion of euros, of dollars actually, uh, that the new climate economy report mentioned. Actually, I would like to justify this goal of 90 trillion of dollars because even Antonio Guterres, the Secretary General of the United Nations, said that at least SDG 7, the Sustainable Development Goal 7, in order to be realized, that is to have a more sustainable energy system, we need to develop at least $37 trillion. And in addition to that, the World Economic Forum measured that if we would like up to this point, this amount of $37 trillion to promote green buildings and also cleaner transportation and implement waste solutions and waste and water to energy, then this money will end up another $23 trillion investment. So you can understand that if we would like to move forward completely and fully to a to towards um, a clean and climate economy, then we do need this amount of money, and this is very important. There is actually recently a private investors initiative, which is called Climate Action 100 Plus. And this is an investor-led initiative, which they have more than 32 trillion dollars in assets under management and they aim to push the world's 161 carbon emitters to take stronger action on climate change. So we can see that both the private and the public sector, they move towards investments for climate and energy and environment. That means that we do have the financial resources available. These financial resources, they amount to billions and trillions, and there are more to come. What needs to be done? We need to have a public sector that is very decided to move forward to this type of investments and create both domestically and regionally and globally the framework, the legal and the tax framework that is stable enough in order to be friendly to investors to invest in this type of investments. And also we need the global legislator to create a global level field, as we call, in order to avoid unfair competition and also promote the um, financial investments of this type globally. Last, we need to take some of the existing organizations that work with climate investments and make them more effective, such as, for example, the Standing Committee of the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change that is in charge for boosting investments, but it is very low and we need to make it better. Closing, I would like to um, invite the speakers today and uh, our very honored guests to have another seminar in our region, in Western Peloponnese, both in uh, Costa Navarino and in ancient in St. Olympia. And Sid Gunnar said that uh, Sweden would like to request once again and host the Olympic Games. And since I'm from ancient Olympia, please come to organize a seminar between Stockholm and Olympia and help you win the Olympic Games next time. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Ionisia, for this lively presentation. And uh, before we move with a discussion session, 
just I would like to pick up from one of your last uh, slides, Gunnar, to inform our guests here that Greece and the National Observatory of Athens is actually uh, coordinating one of the largest umbrella projects of the European Commission on smart cities. So since it is one of your uh, hum humble targets, I would like to inform you that Sweden and Stockholm is one of the pilot cities that we are having in the project and they work, work hand by hand together with Athens to become smart cities in the areas of uh, air quality, disasters and urban growth. So uh, to move on in the session, uh, I have some questions uh, to exploit the presence of our distinguished panelists here. And the first question comes uh, for Guna. And uh, as you mentioned in 2010, Stockholm was the first European city ever to be awarded the European Green Capital title. So I wanted to know what was the real incentive behind pursuing such a target and which were the most critical elements that actually led you to succeed this effort. And uh, I was also wondering, did you always have consensus in the city hall while planning or applying these green policies? Uh, to answer the lot, no. Um, for example, the congestion charges was an example where it divided the city council into a left wing and into right wing. But today it's a consensus about uh, congestion charges uh, 10 years or a little bit more than 10 years after the introduction of congestion charges. Uh, it was, uh, uh, the climate program was a d discussion. Not all you know, political parties supported their climate goals in, 19, in 1990, that we, when we started the climate program. But today, uh, we have a political consensus. And the public is, has a, they were against the congestion charges, but once they saw it, they changed their mind, and today 65% is in favor and, uh, it's a, uh, uh, of the congestion charges. When it comes to the green capital, uh, um, yeah, well, it started more like a call from a student in a journalist university outside Stockholm, and she asked if we would run for the green capital of Europe and put by initiative from Estonia, uh, the Commission and Eurocities and Eclair had started a program for awarding the green capital of Europe. And I said, what is that? And, uh, and she said, I send you a link, and I send the link, and then I uh, passed it on to my members or my staff, and we worked for it in, for, uh, well, we were first shortlisted, it was we and Amsterdam and Copenhagen and Oslo and Amsterdam, Münster and, and Hamburg and, and, and Stockholm. And the final, the, the final uh, paper that we wrote was a hundred pages English text that the executive committee of the city for the first time had an English text to decide on. And people were uh, very happy and they said, oh, fantastic. We never know how much Stockholm had done. And the, when we are running for an award, you have to show what you are good at. And that was the first time we actually made in Stockholm. So it changed the mindset. Uh, the, it changed the mindset in the Conservative Party. It changed the mindset in the Green activists who said everything is not bad. And they were more focusing on the solution that you, you one, uh, spoke about. Don't focus about uh, the, the obstacles, but focus on the solution. We can make it if we, if we take action now. And that was, we showed that we had and we showed the plans and the system thinking in Stockholm that everything is linked into each other. That's why we won. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I will keep consensus at the end of the day and the gradual change of mentality. Good. Uh, Dionysia, I will try to take advantage of your uh, engagement in the Global Water Partnership Organization. And we know very well that water and climate, no doubt, are very well interlinked. So the United Nations have adopted specifically SDG 6 to address uh, management of water. But still, the specific indicators uh, seem to be targeting developing countries. And I know that there have been some activity uh, from Eurostat to adjust these indicators to the European standards. And I, don't, I also know that the same is happening in the ministry, in the Greek ministry, uh, here, uh, with the cooperation of the Hellenic Statistical uh, Office. So my question is, 
which will be, to your opinion, the actual water management challenges for the European cities of tomorrow, and what should be the planning and investments needed to adequately and timely face those challenges? Thank you very much for the question. Um, first of all, just to put it uh, right, the SDGs, they don't focus developing countries. They focus on both developing and developed countries. However, since the SDGs, they are the follow-up of the MDGs, the Millennium Development Goals, of course, there are some indicators that specifically address developing countries only. However, we have to take into account as Europeans that SDGs and the Development Agenda 2030, it is just the baseline for development, for sustainability. Uh, because Europe is much more advanced than the rest of the world, actually, regarding sustainability issues. And let me remind to um, all of us that Europe was the leader in the so-called Ambition Coalition for Climate Change. So Europe could does and should make many more than the average global community and is doing that. Actually, the European Union has developed uh, a new report on the cities for tomorrow, our future cities. And in Europe, we do share a same, let's say so, vision on how a city should be, a sustainable city should be. And water courses are in the core of this sustainability of the cities of tomorrow, Stockholm has performed very well because Stockholm has made good use of the water courses that it has as part of the city. On the other way, Athens has not performed very well on that. Let's uh, just remind to uh, the people that they live in Athens that we used to have some rivers in the center of Athens and these rivers do not exist anymore. However, in the majority of the big European cities, rivers are in the heart of them. So we need to rebuild and depollute and show up again and rehabilitate our water courses, the courses that existed in the cities and they are not in good shape anymore, first of all. And secondly, we should take into account that maybe Europe does not suffer out of drought. However, there are some cities, especially in the province, such as, for example, in Greece in the, on the islands, and in some other cases, also in the capital, that drought exists, and drought is heavily linked to climate change. So we have to recreate our zincs, the water zincs. There is a great program on behalf of the Global Water Partnership Mediterranean to create once again the historic zincs from ancient years up to now that existed especially on the islands in order to capture the rainwater once again. And also so once again the history between the water management and the evolution of the human activities as water mills etc the other thing that um, we should pay attention is our modern architecture water should be into the center of water architecture of our uh, urban architecture, because water could be a stabilizer to the augmentation of temperature. Let's uh, take as an example, for example, here in Athens, the Stavros Niarchos Foundation, that they have used some small amounts of water that go around the building in order, among others, to lower down the temperature of the building and the area. And last, which is very important and is linked to public health, we have to depollute all the water that exists because there is a great percentage of water that is polluted and is not able to be reused. So we need to reuse the water that we already use and not exhaust the resources that we have. Right. Thank you very much. Just to inform you that we as parts of the scientific community and active members of the uh, intergovernmental initiative which collects the Earth Observation, there is a great movement on how Earth Observation can actually contribute to the monitoring and actually in the achievement of the Sustainable Development Goals. And uh, it's actually a great movement in Europe now that the statistical offices and NSOs are talking with the Earth Observation community and trying to find ways uh, how to collaborate, and this is something, a discussion that has already started in uh, Greece, and we would like to bring it much further. 
So my last question is going to be a common question to both of you, and we may reverse the order in the replies, and we'll start with you, Dionysia. Uh, what should it be, to your opinion, the role that Europe can play, and what con concrete actions should be taken to establish European leadership in what has been the theme of our session, the climate smart investments and this anticipated global transformation we're talking about? Well, I think in, an example from, from Stockholm and Sweden, um, when we were the green capital, it was a breakthrough for investors and developers come to Stockholm and make their investments. That was uh, one of the basic, I would say sustainable Stockholm is one of the basic um, uh, branding for the city of Stockholm. The carbon tax, that has, was introduced in Sweden for 1991, uh, and today is uh, about 100, a little bit more than 100 euros a ton CO2 emit from uh, uh, companies outside the trading sector, has transformed Sweden to the uh, uh, to a low carbon uh, uh, nation when it comes to heating and industries, and if. We could have a carbon tax in Europe that pushed the transformation in Europe and the, uh, the business community in Europe to low carbon. That would be an advantage in the global um, uh, competition. Uh, that's my belief. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that Europe is doing a great job, actually, and my first <laughs> response was to keep Europe running as it does. Let me just mention to you that we were in Paris in 2015 signing the agreement, the Paris Agreement, and after a week when we returned back home, we had the first grants on behalf of the European Union to relate to this Paris Agreement in order to give some hundreds of euros to Paris-related projects. That was the quickest response that I have seen before the signing of an international agreement and the implementation, actually, of the mandate of the agreement within a week. Mm -hmm. Secondly, uh, the European Union should take the lead in order to make this framework, this sustainability framework for investments, more legally binding. Because right now, globally, everybody speaks about sustainable investments, about responsible investments, impact investments. But this is only wishful thinking. So we're just trying to raise some ambition regarding sustainability in investments. But there is no legal framework that would impose the necessity to have sustainable factors in investments globally. And you Europe, as I mentioned in my speech, in my presentation, has recently adopted a directive and um, a, a new framework on sustainability investments. But this framework is only for Europe. And once again, it's not legally binding. So we need to make it legally binding and secondly, to make it global. Okay. Europe has to take the lead. Good. So thank you very much. I would like to thank the two panelists and thank you all for your attention and patience. And I think 